from Mume in Taipei. Please welcome chef owners Richie Lin, Long Xiong, and Kai Ward. <laughs> So, for those of you who don't know, this is Richie, this is Long, and this is Kai. Hi, everyone. And they're going to tell us a little Hello, bit uh, about the back, their backgrounds and the backgrounds uh, to the restaurant and how they created it. Over to you. Hello. 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 Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I'm Richie. Uh, first of all, we are extremely honored to be on stage today. Thank you, 50 Best. Thank you, William. It's our extreme honor to be on stage today to share our story, and um, yeah, this is it, long. I mean, there's so many people in the audience that we, some are friends and some we know, and some very many we look, uh, look up to. And so, uh, yeah, just, just again, a real honor, uh, especially with Chef Andre Chang and uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Like, that's, that's something that you really look forward to, being able to, at some point, share a stage with someone like that, who's, who's, a, who's generally someone you really look up to. Uh, yeah, so, so really, really an honor just to, just to be here uh, in, in front of you guys. Um, I guess we can just begin with sometimes uh, answering a couple of questions of, uh, that we often get asked. Um, sometimes we get asked how we, how we met, you know. Uh, we're just going to keep yeah. it quite casual yeah. conversation, yeah. so we'll, we'll go back and forth with each other. Um, how we met, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe go from the beginning, three, I yeah. guess. Yeah, cool. so uh, myself and Richie <laughs> worked at a uh, key restaurant in Sydney. Uh, back in 2010, 11, I think. Yeah. And then we worked we'll together for a yeah. few years. Uh, and then after that, uh, Richie made the move over to Copenhagen, uh, where he met Long, uh, working at Noma. Yeah, and yeah we were doing an intern in Noma. From there, yeah. We met there, spent a little bit of time together, and then after that, uh, Richie had a friend opening a project in Hong Kong, and then so both of us went to Hong Kong. Uh, we worked on a project for a year. Um, at which point Richie decided, let's, let's try Taiwan. Yeah, so at the time, I, I, Hong Kong and Taipei is very close. It's a one and a half hour flight. So I took a trip to Taichung, actually. Uh, I'm quite familiar with Taipei because I always, often take a short trip to Taipei just for, just for short vacations. I went to, I remember I went to Taichung, I went to uh, some countryside, and then there's a, a vegetarian restaurant which they serve hot pot. And I went there, I went in, it was almost sh shocked me. It was filled with like 20 different vegetables I've never seen before. It was like, it was like walking with a, like a, a kid went into a candy shop. So I tasted everything and none of them I've ever tasted before. Some are very pungent, some is aromatic. Everything was so new to me. At that moment I was like, wow, Taiwan has so much to offer. It is so diverse. It's just a random hot pot restaurant that I went into, and then I, uh, there's filled with 20 different vegetables I've never tasted before. I thought I'd know something um, from, from back then, all my uh, restaurant that I worked in and all the training we had, but uh, actually I know nothing. So at, the po at, at that moment, I was like, wow, Taiwan is something really, it is very, very underrated. And then so I have that, I have that thinking in my mind. Uh, probably there was, this will be something that we can do in, ta in Taiwan. So, um, so I took more trips back and forth from Hong Kong to Taipei while we were setting up another restaurant. And then I started to do a lot of research on the internet and I started to go to more different places around Taiwan. And the more I get into it, the more I feel like the, the more it surprised me and the more I feel like I'm connected to this, this place. So um, I made a decision at the end. I was like, um, wow. I, I, I remember I called up Long and I was like, dude, you have to come here. This is crazy, man. This is like, <laughs> this is like something that I've never seen yeah. before. Like, you got to come. So, so uh, I think he took a trip. Maybe like a three days or something? Yeah, just a, a quick three day trip. We yeah. had one or two friends in, in, in town that had their own small business and we're just kind of getting a feel for what it was and it just felt like a very like a untapped natural resource. Like it's an island, right? So that makes it extra interesting because you get a lot of things that grow there that don't grow elsewhere, right? And they, they kind of develop into their own, they like speciate into their own little thing. Mm. And so that makes things a lot more interesting. So actually we, we do have a plate 
on your table that has a lot of kind of uh, natural native uh, things to Taiwan. We can talk more about that later, but, but if, you're, if you're interested in some of the things that maybe Richie saw at the hot pot or some, some interesting uh, products that we, we get yeah. to play with. And feel free to touch it and smell it. Uh, some is a little prickly, uh, prickly yeah, so be careful. Be careful. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't some have thorns, yeah, so, yeah. So just, yeah. Just be careful. Just be careful of the thorns. I should add that uh, the, the guys are going to prepare a dish a little later and you're all going to be served uh, the steamed fish dish. Um, which they'll talk about a little later, but that's uh, so some of the, the products on there were, are related to that dish, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, mm. yeah. I just wanted to ask a question of you guys. It seems a, a, an amazingly kind of ambitious thing to go to um, a region which has all these, these ingredients that you've never worked with before. You guys are experienced chefs, you've worked in, in some of the best restaurants in the, in the world, but you set, you set yourself a huge challenge by going to work with ingredients that you hadn't worked with before. What uh, what made you do that? Just the, the excitement of the new? Yeah, I think a big part of that is to challenge yourself. And yeah. I think opening a new restaurant, it allows you to continue to educate yourself yeah. while you have set yourself out of the comfort zone. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of the reason why I choose Taipei, because that's something that really out of our comfort zone. Yeah. I, I there's something more interesting about being playing with ingredients that other people don't get to play with. Um, it, it's not really how like things are priced. It's like oh, we get better caviar than that person. It's just like okay, well, nobody has this vegetable, or not not nobody, right? Because many native people in Taiwan use it, sure. um, but nobody's really put a put a focus on it on an international level. And something that we were like okay, well, let's take a look at it and re-examine it a little bit and and put a fresh set of eyes on it and see what we can come up with. And so that makes it a bit more um, fun. Um, yeah, and, and you just explore a bit more because, again, we've all come from kind of Western countries and you get quite similar types of products in most places generally. And so when you're on a, yeah, you're on an isol isolated island with like aboriginals and things like that, then you get a lot of kind of very new, interesting things uh, that can happen. As well as the infrastructure of Taiwan is quite good. So there's a lot of... Uh, good resources in order to build a restaurant, so, yeah. And one, of, one of the most surprised ingredient and still one of our favorite ingredients in the restaurant, you, you have a little small soy sauce uh, plate with uh, some pepper-like uh, pepper. Yeah, they, they, look, they look like, like peppercorns. Pepper like pepper yeah. So you feel free to touch it, uh, rub it with your hand and Here's smell it. One, yeah. It's. I remember the first time I encountered this ingredient in Taiwan, I walked into a countryside where uh, okay. they have all these, we call it magao, it's a wild pepper that is widely used by the Aboriginal in Taiwan. I remember the first time I encountered it is I went into a, a countryside, a, a farm, where they have some wild uh, magao tree. Uh, it's not commercially cultivated, so I, I went into it, they're, they're blossoming, they're flowering. I couldn't tell what it is. It was like lemony, gingery, it was f very aromatic. It's like walking into a perfume shop. So I was like, oh, wow. It, it's just, it, it's, at the time, I don't know what it is, so I, I, I didn't realize what it is. And then I went into, later on, I went to a, a Aboriginal restaurant in Taiwan, and then I had some, some, uh, some of their dishes, and I had a bite. We, uh, a bite into it, and then it's just instantly you have a pop in your mouth. It's like, whoa, this is crazy. This is like something I've never thought of. Like, it's so powerful. If you, if you want to try, you can put one in your mouth. Feel free, but it's, it's a little bit peppery, nummy, but smell it. It's amazing. It's one of the best ingredients we could find in Taiwan. And we, this is something that we kind of like the aha moment when, we, when, we, when we're doing in Mumei. It's like, wow, just one ingredient that showcase in Taiwan is so much diversity. We use it in so many different ways. We, yeah. you, will, you, will have to, you will taste it in one of the, the dishes that we're going to prepare as well. But in the restaurant, we use it in so many different ways. We make cocktails with it, we dehydrate them, we infuse them into oil, and then we season fish with this, seafood and everything. And then also we, uh, we pickle them, we make cocktails with them, we make ice cream with them. It's, made meringues, yeah, everything. It's it's like, just like, it's, yeah, it's just it's amazing. Just, just one ingredient that we discover, it makes so much application in, in, in our restaurant. So imagine we have 20 ingredients, how much, how much different or new techniques or new ingredients that we can come up with. 
So, um, yeah, one. with that said, uh, Kai is going to show you a little bit uh, demonstration because it takes some time to, to set. Yep. So I'll, I'll let him uh, sure. do this. Yeah, so uh, this is another ingredient that we found uh, while we're in Taiwan. Uh, down? Yeah. So this is a IU. Uh, so it's a seed, comes from a, a fruit sort of similar to a fig. Uh, and it has a sort of like a natural gelling quality to it. Uh, so what we do is we've made a ginger stock. Uh, and then we'll take uh, the IU seeds, put it into a bag, place it into the stock, and then we just agitate it for about well, five minutes, sure. roughly. Yeah. yeah. So the Aboriginal, uh, normally, they, they don't have a machine, right? So they, they use their hand, they rub it with uh, water or uh, anything. Yeah. So they, they rub it with the hand. And then if you continue to do so, it will start to thicken. So you have a thickened liquid. If you, if you put it in something to s just let it set, it will become a jelly. And then so we, it's, like, it's like a one of the natural uh, hydrocolines that is within the fruit. So it will set naturally. And then so recently, we want to go back to, to these amazing uh, ingredients. And it's indigenous to Taiwan. And we want to play with it again. So we, we tried it a lot of different, uh, different ways. Yeah. And then one of the very interesting way we found is it is actually, the jelly actually is heat resistant. So I don't know why I came up with this idea, but it was kind of crazy. <laughs> I, just, I just took the jelly and put it in a pan and, try to, and start to cook it, like to pan fry it, but it didn't melt. So it just stay, it is like a piece of jelly. And then so we were like, oh wow, this is something really special. Because yeah, in can... Taiwan, you often find it in the night market. Right. They, they, they have a big block of it, they put some uh, lemon juice or sugar, so it's like kind of like a, jank, a drink, like a, like a sugary drink. Um, it's like a, like a cold jelly. So it, yeah. I never thought it would be able to apply in a hot situation. So we will, we will incorporate that into our dish as well. Um, yeah, and I'll let Kai continue with the demonstration. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so I mean, yeah, I mean, so again, none of us is from Taiwan. And so when we first get there, uh, yes, you're, you're, you're overwhelmed by all the beautiful things and all the products. But it's also like, oh, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Which I think is no often idea. the case, right? So you count as something new, but then that's where you, your adventure begins. That's where you start exploring and finding and playing, uh, and you go from there. Um, but in the beginning, it was quite a struggle. There's a lot of things that were really, really difficult, because we're, we're really just a small group of no, no major backer, no nothing, no, no not major backer, no minor backer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just, just us, just, just trying just, to just figure it out, right? Independent, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so... so yeah. I just asked, did you, um, did you find any, any resistance from, from producers, because you guys are not from the region, uh, were they very happy to share their product with you and teach you about it, or did you have to you know, work quite hard to integrate yourself into it? It takes a little bit of time to yeah, gain their exactly. trust and work with them a little bit, because in the beginning, when, when you first get to Taiwan, this is where Taiwan was at, at the point, we were like, oh, we're opening a Western restaurant, can we have a product list with maybe prices? And then at that point, you kind of decide which direction you want to go and how you want to try. And they're like, okay, you're French or Italian? And we're like, uh, not really either or. And they're like, well, you're either French or Italian if you're Western, right? Either yeah. you're Chinese or you're French or Italian. And we were like, uh, I don't know. Can we just have a product list? And they're like, well, it depends on if you're French or Italian. And I, it's just, it's a little bit frustrating because you're like, well, why? Anyway. Um, so yeah, so, so then, then you finally get a price list or, or at least a product list. Uh, and then the names of things are a little bit strange, right? There's one that's called uh, Mei Ren Tui. Mei Ren Tui, right? So, so what does that mean? That's, uh, that means like a beautiful girl's legs, right? So then, okay, so, so, that, so the thing so. is, <laughs> Richie can read and write. He's from Hong Kong. Uh, myself and Kai are like illiterate, basically. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and so we're I, yeah. just trying to figure it out. It was a real struggle because I actually, after they arrived in Taiwan, I, found, I, I just found out I, I hired two like illiterate guy. They, they can't read anything yeah. in Taiwan. Yeah. It's like, I'm the Not only really one who can read and speak Chinese. Yeah. And, and also, he, at the time, he's setting up his first restaurant ever, right? So there's all the other extraneous things that you have to take care of. And we were like, okay, let's just focus on the menu and see what we can come up with. But then when you have names like that on Google Translate, it's like, where do you begin with the lady legs? <laughs> <laughs> um, so so along with that, we had some other challenges. Um, 
like in the beginning, like financially, yes. When, when you begin, you're like, oh, we, we want to get the most beautiful plates, the most beautiful cutlery, uh, the most beautiful lighting and furniture and all of that. And uh, what we end up with was IKEA plates. Because yeah. that's, that's the only that's, plate that we can afford. That's what you can afford, right? Yeah. Because when you start, you just kind of, you got to make it happen, right? You have, you've already started paying rent and you have like a deadline, right? You got to open at a certain point. And so sometimes, it's not that we couldn't find beautiful plates, it's just that you couldn't afford them. And so, you know, you just kind of, sometimes you have to make things happen and you, you just got to, you got to open and, and go from there and then see, Get see what you can going. do from there, right? Yeah, so exactly. it's not a proudest moment, but, but I think it's an honest one. And so, so we do the best that we can and, and, and you go from there. And when, um, when did you guys open and how do you feel you've developed over the, over the time since you've opened? We opened about three and a half years ago? Yeah, end yeah, of 2014. End of 2014. Yeah. Which was actually quite fortunate for us because Raw uh, by Chef Andre was also opening at the time. And so I think that was really fortuitous for us yeah. uh, in the sense that if you're the first one to do kind of something very modern and Western, people are like, what are these guys doing? It's not French or Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have someone else doing something also very modern and interesting with their own, own different perspective, then that's when you start having a discussion. And actually just being in the conversation as one of the newer restaurants at the same time as Raw was really beneficial for us. Then, like, it's like, oh my god, you're in the same conversation as, 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 as a restaurant by Chef Andre. So then it's like, wow, okay. Well, um, then, then you already have quite a, a good head start. And so, so that was really, really fortunate for us, right? Uh, I'm not sure how it would have gone had, had that not been the case. Um, so I want to go back to yeah, the Yeah, maybe talk about yeah. this quickly, because you yeah. can really see it's thickened up quite a lot. So it's really starting to gel together. So we're just going to pass that through the sieve, make sure there's no little seeds. And then yeah. once it's passed, oh, that's fine. And then once it's passed, we just leave it at maybe well, it'll half, half an hour to half 40 hour. minutes. Yeah, maybe? exactly. Maybe if it's feeling fast, it'll, it'll yeah. accept by the time we finish. <laughs> exactly. And then, um, yeah. So, so, yes, we started from IKEA plates. But in the past three and a half years, we've managed to reinvest uh, in the business, and we opened a studio, which is kind of like a little separate workspace. For those of you that have been to Mume, the, the kitchen is a bit small, and so when you have three additional people going in trying to not just run normal service, just like trying to become a little bit more creative and play with things, that's when it becomes a little bit challenging, right? If you take someone's burner, then they can't do their mise en place. If you take the one pot that's necessary to do that one particular project, then it becomes challenging, and so we're fortunate enough to be able to reinvest and have another little space, and, and that allows us to be a bit more creative uh, and play with some other things that we might not otherwise be able to, and have the space to be creative. Yeah, I, I think it's also very good for us to allow us to, to have a separate space so we can completely dedicate it to like doing testing ingredients and doing research and, and, and just to get away from the everyday crazy environment like the, the kitchen. Um, so we can actually focus on doing a lot more uh, interesting stuff to, to let us to be allowed to, like, yeah. we, if we want to revisit some of the ingredients, we can, we can do so. Uh, also, there's much more room for us to, to do, uh, like, say, fermentation. And also, this is something that we will, we will demonstrate later on. Uh, as you all know, rice is one of the main um, grains that we consume, Chinese people. So uh, we learned a technique in, um, in Japan, making um, koji by uh, inoculating rice. So we will use that later on in, one, in our uh, demonstration. And, uh, and what, what sort of proportion of, uh, of your products are, are from uh, the Taiwan region, what, uh, the vast majority of the menu made yeah. up of absolutely, yeah, absolutely ninety percent. I think about ninety yeah, percent. All the vegetable foods they are from Taiwan. Um, most of the proteins and seafood, and we try to source everything from Taiwan yeah. as we can. Currently, we I think we have more than 90, 95 suppliers that we use from Taiwan, all growing individual ingredients or like very like specialized. Uh, things. Because a lot of them, they are very small farmers, right? Yeah. So you, you, you get one small farms in Taiwan, maybe they're just really good at just growing carrots or just cherry tomatoes. And so it ends up to be, if you, if you limit yourself into just using local ingredients, then you will come up with a, 
a big list of suppliers that you have to deal with because it's usually yeah they don't have the distribution system yeah necessary and, to, and, so. and the logistic of it is uh, also a, a challenge because most most cases is they only do one or two things and then if you have a if you have a menu that you know you Use it consistently. easily you have more than 50 to 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 80 uh, suppliers mm. to, to work with yeah in in the current menu so it's it's an ongoing thing as well yeah so it's still growing yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should. and in terms of customers so I'm distracting you from, but in terms of customers do you have um lots of l local taipei customers or uh visitors to to the island or both and what's the kind of yeah what's it's a the good proportion mix, i think yeah i think when we mix. first started i would say the majority is like 90% uh, were locals. Uh, nowadays, it's sort of a bit more evenly balanced. Um, yeah, it, it depends. I mean, you can, sometimes you walk through the, the restaurant, six o'clock, everyone's speaking Chinese, and then by 8.30, everyone's speaking English. There's just like different mix of people. So it's, yeah, makes it uh, interesting for us. All right, I think we're going to start our dish now real quick, just because some of you may be getting it, and we want to let you know what exactly you're getting. Um, okay, so today we're going to do a steamed fish. It's something that we're actually not serving in the restaurant at the moment. It's something new that we're trying to, to figure it out as well. Uh, we have a similar version in the restaurant. Um, I think the reason that I really want to do this dish is because it's, it showcases um, uh, a good mix of my background. Um, so we have a fish, uh, a grouper. Normally, we, we have a very good quality grouper in Taiwan. So we uh, simply we just yeah. marinate it or yeah, yeah. age it. Yeah. So we season it with the koji. And so that, what the koji does is it has an enzyme that breaks down the proteins on the surface of the fish. And it breaks it into amino acids, which adds a little bit of sweetness and it adds a little bit of umami. So, and it also tightens up the fish. Um, the fish sure, 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 sorry. Uh, so so this, this is been marinated, but yeah. So, so this I just sprinkled just now with the koji, and then this is what we what happens to it after two days. Um, so it tightens up, it gets a little bit firmer, uh, and should be a little bit more sweet than, than normal. So I'm going to continue with the cooking. So, yeah, um, as I said, because I'm, I'm, I'm from Hong Kong, I grew up in a Cantonese uh, family. My, my parents are Indonesian Chinese, but I, I grew up eating Cantonese food in Hong Kong. So, in my opinion, Cantonese is the is the one of the best cuisine to to cook fish. They all they often steam the fish. So, this is the way I like yeah. the fish to be done. So, I choose to use a not a very Western way to cook it. So, I want to steam it just to keep the moisture and make it very delicate. Um, so, we will start after. So after two days of marinade, we wash the koji off, and then we just steam it uh, in our oven here. Uh, Mille oven. See. This one. So it's kind of dry here. aging the fish. It will tighten up the meat a little bit. But after it's cooked, it will soften it. So it takes about five minutes or so. And then you will have a, uh, some of you are already eating it. So um, you will have a, a fish consomme at the end which is very similar to uh, Japanese uh, stock, like a Japanese dashi. Mm -hmm. um, so it's because we did, we, we did quite a lot of collaboration and pop-up in Japan, and well, Japanese cuisine is also one of my favorite. So from my background, a Cantonese, I, I choose the way cooking the fish in a Cantonese way, but then I want to keep it very light and refreshing. and. Yeah. And often you have a Cantonese steamed fish, you always have a soy sauce, a soy sauce with a little bit of sweetness. So I, I want to make it lighter. So I want to make a fish stock or consomme. Also, I can use everything from the fish. So usually we take off the fillet and then we use the head and we, we use the, all the bones and everything else to make the stock. Should they be putting anything from the, the little yes. dishes on the table onto well, there, there, the, onto there the be fish? Some in there as well, yeah. already yeah. infused. As um, some of you may be eating at the moment, uh, if you receive the dish, um, if you can smell it, the lemon 
flavor that is that we infuse at the end is from the wild pepper, is from the from the magal. And um, yeah, so we go back to the Cantonese steam fish. Sure, sure, sure. So um, yeah, often you on top of the steam fish you have scallion, right? You have scallion, you have cilantro, you have some herbs, freshen it. Ginger. So and ginger, yeah. So mm. so I put ginger, kombu, and usually it's is the the rest of the, the fish body. But instead, I'm going to use some trimmings, trimmings yeah. from the fish. So, so just waiting for it to boil, yeah. Everything in? Okay, so what I just put in is uh, the interesting part about, about this uh, consomme is there's no water in it. I use uh, a sake that is made in Taiwan because they have uh, a lot of rice uh, production as well. There's, there's a great uh, sake uh, brewers in Taiwan as well. There's local made sake. So I put sake instead of water, so a fermented rice wine instead of water. So everything is from uh, the sake. There's no single drop of water that I put in this, the, this uh, consomme. And I really slowly let it infuse for long hours. But the ingredients is very simple. So you have fish trimmings, fish bones, kombu, ginger, uh, some katsubushi, and some of the magao. And you just let it cook. You see this color is like water, right? But after maybe five, six hours of very, very low temperature si simmering, you see the stock is golden. It's from when all the alcohol evaporate from the stock, you have a very natural sweetness from the sake, which uh, resembles the, 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 soy, the soy sauce that you have in the Cantonese steamed fish. And at the end, we have, um, once, the, once the fish is finished, I'm going to assemble them. And uh, yeah. we have uh, the green oil that you have. It's a uh, lemon thyme oil. It's just to mimic the, the fresh herb flavors on top of the, uh, the steamed fish. And also we have a bit of salty fingers. Normally we use a sea purslane from, uh, from Taiwan that um, some of the Aboriginal people, they will do uh, foraging for us. And then we often get uh, some interesting ingredients, sea source ingredient from them. So on the table, there's also the sea purslane. But because today we couldn't find that much in, in, in Macau for 300 yeah. people. So, <laughs> so instead, we use uh, uh, salty fingers, some uh, cilantro and... And when do, you, when do you see this dish or a version of this dish going on the menu uh, at Mume? Not sure. I mean, uh, yeah. again, it's always a little bit experimental. You kind of play around a little bit and kind of see, see if it still needs to evolve even. Because um, again, we haven't really put this on... It's not from the menu. It's maybe a combination of a couple different ideas that we think represents us. So you have the broth, that may be a little bit Japanese-leaning, but because Taiwan was previously uh, occupied by Japan, then there's a lot of Japanese influence in Taiwan, and that's just, that's just the way it is. Um, and then you have the steam grouper, which is, reflects Richie's background a bit. And then wh what we do to make it a bit more interesting is to add the koji, uh, and, and that kind of gives it something a little bit extra, a little bit extra. Uh, and then we have the ayu jelly, which is, again, a local product. Uh, I'm going to grab the fish real quick, and then we'll, we'll we can yep. play it up. Play it up a little bit. Go and show that to the camera. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. You just have a close up of the steamed fish. Yeah. And for those that, that don't know uh, about Mumu, do you have a, a tasting menu and an a la carte option? What are, what's the. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, uh, so, actually, uh, one of the things I think that makes this a little bit different sure. is okay. that we uh, only serve a la carte in the, uh, the main part of the restaurant. Uh, and we only do a tasting menu downstairs in our private dining room. Um, when we first opened, we weren't sure, obviously, if the restaurant was going to work, for starters. Um, but we really wanted to do something that really reflects us and where we like to eat and you know, where we want to go on our day off. Uh, and we, we've found that you know, we've, the, 
eating an a la carte menu. It's just a lot more fun, it's a lot more upbeat, uh, allows you to share a lot more. Yeah. Um, and time constraint wise, like if you want to go in and have like a couple desserts after after a main dinner or something, it, it makes it a lot more flexible. Yeah, as well as menus, exactly. like things can come on, things can come off. It's very easy. Yeah, we don't have to have like 30 perfect radishes right, because right. we have 30 people that night. It's just like, okay, we have mm -hmm. 10, so let's just put 10 on the menu. And that, yeah. we go from there, so. So how many seats in the, in the downstairs area? Downstairs, we maximum do, 12, yeah, maximum 12. 12, 10 to 12. And, is, then, uh, and then in the main dining room? Uh, upstairs, was it 28, 30, roughly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so 300 is a pretty big jump up from that. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. But, but yeah, hopefully we did all right. Our team back at win. Yeah. Or uh, backstage. Um, yeah. So is that? Yeah. So yeah. Is there anything else we want to cover? And Just talk it? through the plating, Richie, of the dish. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. How you placed it? So as uh, I think most of you already got the dish. So uh, we also have a are you ginger jelly, which we just demonstrate on stage. As you can see. This one is we did earlier this morning. Maybe a little. You see a very firm jelly. And even when we pour like a super hot broth onto the, the plate, it still remains solid. And does it take that texture at room temperature or do you put it in the fridge? Or? Uh, you can set it in room temperature. Yeah, it, will, it will naturally set it in room temperature. And we like it a lot because it's in between like an agar and gelatin. It's Maybe a little bit firmer than gelatin, but also is heat resistant, so it's better than agar, uh, better than gelatin, sorry, but not as like brittle. Brittle. Yeah. As, it's the texture as, as, as well. But, yeah. So um, yeah, this is something that we really like to incorporate into savory side rather than serving it traditionally in um, in a sweet side. So. Normally this cooks for like six hours. Six or more. to yeah. ten hours. Yeah. It really depends. You do you keep it very low. Yeah. The consomme. Just, the just consomme. Let it yeah. Infuse yeah. Exactly. Really, really gently. Yeah. 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 That's the biggest batch I made yesterday. <laughs> yeah. For three hundred people, I've never done that much of yeah. fish broth in my life. <laughs> and here we go. This is. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the dish. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much for giving us a little, uh, insight into one of your your dishes uh, and into your restaurant. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Oh, wait, oh, gentlemen, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait oh, a second. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, any, sorry, if sorry. anyone has any questions from the floor, please, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, and we'll run a microphone to you or uh, Laura will have a question or a microphone. Yeah. We'll have, you wanna go? How about some feedback? Sorry. Does anyone have feedback on the dish? Ooh, this is Chef Andre. <laughs> oh my God. Did you enjoy the dish? <laughs> no yes, pressure, no yes, pressure. It's really refreshing. And um, I think the uh, IU is a great ingredient that represents uh, 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 Taiwanese. So being a Taiwanese is very happy and um, being proud to let that, uh, everyone taste, uh, a, a touch something that's really unique about Taiwan. I think you've got the seal of approval there. Oof, the yeah. dish can wow. go on the menu. <laughs> what a, what a Thank you, win. Chef. <laughs> What a win. Uh, do raise your hand if you have a question. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you, I know two of you worked at, at Noma. Can you tell us what the key lessons you learned from that experience was in working with Rene Redzepi? To go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. In terms of experimenting and trying new stuff? Yeah, yeah really? making yeah. decisions, I think. Yeah, making be both no. <laughs> be crazy. And uh, I think one of the biggest influence is you, you always find inspiration back in the nature. That's, that's one of the very important lessons that, we, that I, I personally have learned in, in, at NOMA, is you, you, you have to let the nature guide you. So you, you, you have to learn about the seasonality, what the weather gives you, um, the soil, uh, the people that live in the places, everything that you have to, you have to connect to it. To, to be able to, to create something unique. And that is something that I really, really inspired me in, in, in Noma. And I try to take it uh, as one of our, our inspirations. I mean, for, for myself, 
I, I, I've told this story before, but for me, previously, prior to Noma, I'd worked at mostly just French restaurants. Um, and there's something that co common in French restaurants, you just take yogurt and you hang it overnight, and then the whey drips away, and then you have a firmer yogurt that you can season and you can make uh, different sauces and purees and things like that with. Uh, and so for me, the turning point was, they took this and put it for staff meal, and then they just used the whey. And that was like, oh, okay, boom. You know, it's like 100%, 180 degree from what every other restaurant that I've worked at has done. And so that's when think your eyes just open up. You're like, okay, well, everybody, you know, picks the cilantro leaves or picks watercress leaves and uses the leaves to make puree something. And they pick the leaves and then they use the stems. And so that's when things just open up, right? You're just like, well, stems no, don't have to be waste, right? Weight no doesn't rules. have to be waste. You yeah. can just completely... Turn, turn everything on its table, uh, on its head, and so, so that, that really is a very eye-opening thing, and then once you kind of give yourself into that, then just everything else you just soak up as much as you can, uh, be, be in the presence of greatness, and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and try, try to learn as much as you can. And Kai, you worked with, with Peter Gilmore at Key. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine he was a, a, an influence on you. How would you describe that experience? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Peter also has a very like uh, strong, you know, let nature, you know, uh, decide what you put on a plate. He's very, uh, very into you know sourcing local ingredients and unique ingredients and finding uh, what's best about it. And you know, starting from a seed and going all the way through to the shoot or uh, to the fruit it bears or to the flower, you know. And so it's sort of looking at uh, every part of the plant and not just like, you know, that one single leaf that you need more. Yeah, so I think that's definitely played a big part um, in, yeah. Defining our, who we are. Yeah, yeah, who we are. Thank you very much to our trio of chefs from Mume, Kai, Long and Richie. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you